OJ Simpson, the football star who became a symbol of domestic violence and racial division after he was found not guilty of murdering his ex-wife and her friend in a trial that riveted the nation and had legal and cultural repercussions for years afterward, died at the age of 76. The cause was cancer, according to a post from his family on the social media platform X. Additional details were not immediately available. Democratic officials are looking at their options after Republican secretaries of state in, o in Ohio and Alabama warned them that President Biden might not appear on their ballots in November because of the timing of his expected nomination at the Democratic National Convention in August of this year. And Arizona authorities said, well, authorities said Thursday that they will look into possible efforts to obstruct the investigation into the shooting of a teacher by a six-year-old student at Virginia's Rich Neck Elementary School last year, focusing on what happened to key pieces of evidence in the case. Now, this Commonwealth's attorney, Howard Gwynn, the top prosecutor in Newport News, Virginia, said his office will probe why one of the students or one of the shooters disciplined files disappeared and the other had materials removed from it. Well, state lawmakers immediately sought votes in the legislature to repeal the severe 1864 Arizona abortion law, which was revived on Tuesday by that state Supreme Court. The law bans nearly all abortions, including those in the case of rape and incest, and threatens providers with two to five years in prison. Republicans blocked any efforts by the legislature, including a bill by a GOP representative to repeal the law. And Tennessee lawmakers are considering criminalizing adults who help minors receive gender affirming care without parental consent. A proposal advanced in one of the most eager states to enact policies aimed at the LGBTQ community. The Anti-Defamation League gave Howard University, Harvard University, Harvard University, Harvard University, and 12 other students a failing grade for policies to protect Jewish students from anti-Semitism on campus. The ADL said it selected 85 of the top national and liberal arts colleges for assessments this year and chose those with the highest Jewish student populations. It assigned grades from A through F in a campus anti-Semitism report card, which was released today. And Justice Ann Wal Walsh Bradley of the Wisconsin Supreme Court said today that she would not seek a fourth term next year, setting up another heated contest for majority control of the closely divided court. Justice Bradley is one of the four liberals on Wisconsin's highest court. The three remaining justices are conservative. Justice Bradley, who is 73 years old, has served on that court since 1995. This is the news, and this is Ariva Martin in real time, and I'm your host, Ariva Martin. This is your one-stop shop for today's trending news, expert analysis, and my unfiltered opinions. And this is hour two of Ariva Martin in real time, and this is the hour where we go deeper, where we dig behind those headlines, and we bring you those stories that people are talking about. And there's no bigger story in the news today than the story of O.J. Simpson passing away from cancer at the age of 76. O.J. Simpson garnered national media attention long before the infamous Bronco 60 mile chase on Los Angeles freeways back in 1994. He rose to fame as a football player at USC, becoming a Heisman Trophy winner and going on to be drafted by the NFL and becoming a superstar for the Buffalo Bills. Uh, and he broke more barriers, not just on the football field. He became one of the first African-American athletes to get a major advertising contract. So if you didn't know O.J. Simpson uh, from football, because you didn't watch a lot of football, you knew him from watching him run through airports on those Hertz commercials. Uh, those commercials made him a household name. Uh, in addition to those commercials, he also became one of the first Black athletes to get a major contract uh, to be a commentator for uh, Monday Night Football. Again, one of the first Black athletes to become a uh, movie star of sorts, getting lots of roles in big motion pictures. 
in many ways, he transcended what it meant to be a Black athlete in the 1970s and 80s. And not only did he transcend uh, his position as an athlete, OJ was famous for saying he wasn't Black, that he was, quote unquote, just OJ. Uh, his sentiments about his Blackness angered many in the African-American community. But you saw that same community, the Black community, rally uh, to his defense during that trial, the double murder trial of his ex-wife and her friend, Ron Goldman, uh, murdered in her home, and O.J. Simpson later charged with those two murders. It became a trial that redefined in many ways our criminal justice system, redefined in many, many ways our uh, policing, uh, policing, uh, particularly cases involving DNA, the collection of DNA, and many folks... Uh, are mourning today the loss of O.J. Simpson. Others are still scratching their heads, trying to understand a man who has been described as both controversial and complex. Definitely a complex and controversial relationship with the Black community. Uh, we're going to talk about O.J. Simpson, his life, his legacy, his football career, and that legal trial, the trial that made Johnny Cochran a house, household name, uh, that made stars out of the judge, out of some of the witnesses, out of the prosecuting attorneys, uh, a, a trial that really ushered in a new era of crime shows and court TV, uh, even the network, uh, court TV network was born out of the O.J. Simpson trial. When we come forward, I have uh, one of my legal experts, Mansfield Collins, who was in Los Angeles at the time of the trial, is a criminal defense attorney himself, uh, as well as Jamar Brown is joining us. He's the executive director of the Texas Democratic Party. We're talking about all the racial issues. Did OJ's trial divide the nation along racial lines, or did it shine a bright light on racial divisions that were already there? Stay with us, KBLA Talk 1580. You're listening to Ariva Martin in real time on KBLA Talk 1580. Now. Now your ideas don't have to wait. Now they have everything they need to come to life. Dell Technologies and Intel are creating technology that loves ideas, loves expanding your business, evolving your passions. We push what technology can do so great ideas can happen right now. Find out how to bring your ideas to life at Dell.com. Welcome to Now. A gain sent bead story. Jim was at the laundromat when he heard his ear said Maraca, senor, but his nose said, Hey, freshest scent ever. Following his nose, Jim found a man pouring a bottle of gain sent beads into the washer. The scent, the freshness. Jim blurted, Sir, your scent Maraca smell amazing. Actually, Jim, most noses call them gain scent beads. Try Gain Scent Beads, way fresher than detergent alone. If you love to travel, Capital One has a rewards credit card that's perfect for you. With Venture X, earn unlimited double miles on everything you buy and turn everyday purchases into extraordinary trips. Plus, receive premium travel benefits like access to over 1,300 airport lounges where you just check in and chill out. Open up a world of possibilities with Capital One. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. Lounge access is subject to change. See CapitalOne.com for details. KBLA Talk 1580. We've got a lot to talk about. Talk about. KBLA reminds you that when we fight, we win. And we don't black down. LA Community Action Network, or LA CAN, was formed in 1999 when 25 residents of downtown LA came together and acknowledged the problems that existed in their community and made a commitment to do something about those problems, to stand together, organize, and become a force in the community that demands change. Civil rights and preventing the criminalization of poverty are their core projects. In addition, they take on women's rights, the human right to housing, and healthy food access. LA CAN also has projects focused on economic development, civic participation, voter engagement, and community media. While downtown LA remains their home base, with a particular emphasis on the Skid Row community, in 2007, they expanded their housing and healthy food access work into South Central Los Angeles. 
LA Can believes that power for low-income people and people of color is achieved through a large, active, and well-informed member base that utilizes a multitude of methods to advance their messages and goals. If you'd like to join the Los Angeles Community Action Network and organize people to fight back against oppression, please visit cangress.org. That's cangress.org. This is a community call to action from KBLA Talk 1580. We are back and Jamar Brown and Mansfield Collins are joining me for our one hour segment on OJ Simpson. Well, speaking of freeways, I was on the 405 freeway this morning. And if you live in Los Angeles, you know what I'm talking about. And my phone started ringing off the hook with uh, news media uh, contacting me about the news that OJ Simpson had died. I've been on TV and uh, radio all day talking about his uh, life, his legacy, and that infamous 1995 trial. So we got a lot to cover. I want to start with his football career, because if you are not a football fan, you may not have even known who O.J. Simpson was until you saw those Hertz commercials. So Mansfield, you have been in Los Angeles uh, for a minute, and you probably were here when O.J. Simpson uh, made his debut uh, you know, appearance on the USC team and you know, when he went on to become the Heisman Trophy winner. So take us back to the early days and, and tell us who O.J. Simpson was, because a lot of people don't know his history. O.J. Simpson was probably the first black superstar in terms of entertainment and in terms of celebrity for the black community. Uh, he went to USC, played football at USC, was a Heisman Trophy winner. It was clear when you watched him at USC that you were watching something special. And the black community more or less looked at him as the continuation of Jim Brown. We saw a legend in the making when we looked at, at uh, O.J. Simpson. He ran track. He was fast and he was strong and he was big. So, and he was running through tackles. So he was everything that, uh, that the media and the audience wanted to see. And he was scoring a bunch of touchdowns. He was everything the media and the audience wanted to see. And in the black community, he was a hero. When he went to the pros, he did the same thing. Because there's always that transition when you go from college to the pros. Can you do the same thing? He not only did the same thing, but he even did it better when he went to the pros. And then he started doing television commercials, Hertz, television commercials. He was the first black athlete to do prime time commercials for major manu for major companies. He was the first one. He then went into the movies and, and had an excellent acting career. And then all of a sudden, one day, one day, we, we turn on the rate, we turn on the television. Well, we're going we're gonna to get to that, that one day. Okay. I, I'm glad you gave us that history because I was having a conversation with my daughter and we think those of us who are slightly over 35, think that everybody <laughs> knows who O.J. Simpson is. And my daughter told me it was not until she watched the American crime story where Cuba G Gooding Jr. plays him that she learned about O.J. Simpson. So as I was telling her about the frenzy today, she didn't quite get it. Uh, as you just said, he was the black community's first real superstar. We have to remember that we're talking the 80s and there's a yeah. whole generation of black folks, you know, that have been born since then that don't relate to him in that way. And, and probably are asking Jamar, what, what's all the fuss about? He was married to a white woman. OK, so like, you know, why is that a big deal? So help us understand, Jamar, like for those yeah. people like my daughter who, you know, like, can we go back to regular programming, <laughs> understand how significant <laughs> these barriers were that O.J. Simpson was was breaking through. Yeah, well, the thing is, you know, to be quite honest, I am close in age here, I'm maybe a few years older, uh, where, you know, we learned of O.J. Simpson through the trial. We learned who he was, mm -hmm. and then once we saw the trial oh, taking place... I don't think she was born in the trial. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, I remember the trial. I remember watching, and my parents like, you too young, you need to go sit down somewhere. But, <laughs> <laughs> but... You know, and so that's a lot of, like, my first, right? You know, I didn't get to watch the games. Of course, we went back and, you know, we watched, you know, over the years, and we got to learn all these things, right, that he was the first African-American to do certain things. But in addition to everything Mansfield said, right, he also was one of the first African-American athletes to really monetize, to break into a new economic barrier. And I think we don't talk about that either. 
um, to really op- how do you monetize your talent um, and how do you monetize your skill and hold the league and hold companies and different platforms accountable to some of that. And we see that now with our generation. And, and right. so actually a lot of the lessons he taught, even if we didn't watch him growing up, actually we're learning now in terms of our careers and, and, and how we're navigating these things. And so I think that the, the lessons that he taught, I think his whole career is important and it does matter to this generation. However, if you were there for the trial, that's what you know. And I think that, you know, we have to sometimes look past that and look at what the accomplishments were um, in, in terms of some of that and, and how that parlays today. And so that's the generational divide in my opinion. That's a great point. And you're right. Name, image, and likeness. Big in sports today. Athletes are now being able to cash in on their name, image, and likeness while they are still in college. Some of them making millions and millions of dollars. Uh, And OJ Simpson was one of the first ones, not while in college, but after college, and to monetize his talents beyond sports. Mansfield, again, I was trying to give my daughter this uh, lesson about athletes this was an era where you were told shut up and dribble and you were told shut up and dribble because there was this 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 stereotype this this notion that if you were a black athlete you were probably uneducated you probably left college before you graduated and when you were in college somebody else was taking your test and doing the work so you weren't doing a whole lot there anyhow you know they weren't given media training they weren't the articulate well-spoken uh, commentators and you know folks that we see today, it's kind of hard for her to imagine, but you were there, you and I were there. So we know what it was like. And, and when you would see a black athlete on TV, some of us would cringe. We would, you know, like, oh, because, you know, they, a lot of times the media were perpetuated these very, very negative stereotypes. And a lot of these guys didn't get their education. They were exploited in a lot of ways. You're so you're so correct, uh, Ariva. Uh, OJ was not the um, the standard black athlete. Uh, he was universally recognized in the black community, but he was also universally universally recognized in the white community. Um, but you're correct. He broke all kinds of barriers. He didn't meet the stereotypical assessment that usually the media gives to a, a black uh, athlete during that time. And he was able to turn it into something that we just sort of were marveled at. I mean, every time, every year, there was something new that OJ was doing that was furthering, as Jamar said, monetizing his career. He was very good at that. And that's why when we turn the corner and get to this trial and these charges filed against him, sort of the black community's reaction, first reaction was, well, wait a minute, you're trying to tear down our hero now. And so there was a lot of suspicion and a lot of doubt to start with in terms of whether the charges were proper. So let's do that. Let's talk about the trial. Obviously, uh, that infamous and you probably have seen it, Jamar, the 60 mile slow. I don't even know if you call it a police chase because they weren't really chasing them. Uh, Just a slow (laughs) drive. Uh, We were told that he had a gun to his head by his friend that was driving the car, the Bronco that he was suicidal. He had been told that he was being charged uh, with these murders. And I guess he was trying to escape. It wasn't really clear what he was trying to do. Uh, But people came out on the roads, on the highway, and it became this big spectacle. It became a circus. Even before the trial began, uh, there was this circus-like nature. People and some people were cheering uh, as he was doing this this the slow getaway. What do you make of that? Yeah, well, I think it goes back to what Mansfield was just saying at the end of his remarks is you, you're talking about our hero. This Here's a guy, we don't know him for a police chase. We know him for running on a football field. We know him for making good entertainment on TV. We don't know him for breaking the law. We don't know him for being a murderer. We don't know him for being an abuser, right? The things that were being said in the media even after he was arrested and before the trial. And so what the black community, especially at that time, right? When we're coming out of the eighties into the nineties, these are our first millionaires, right? These are (laughs) some of our first millionaires, right? These are some of our first really highly successful people that actually had platforms, right? On major uh, television networks, et cetera. And so there is that level of when you get to certain heights of your career, what attacks do you face? And is this another attack 
on his character? Is this another attack on the perception that our community built around him? And two, because we saw him reach the top, we wanted to protect him so that we had opportunity for other people to come behind now, right? We see college athletes coming out of college as millionaires. <laughs> walking into the league, right, uh, in a different way. And so I think that that's where you saw some of that divide. And, and then, obviously, everything played out. And, and it's very hard to sometimes watch because you also want to protect your hero and you also want to protect your community. Uh, and I think we're still that way today. Uh, if something happened, God forbid, I'm not saying this will, to President Obama, I think we all will be up in arms. Right. right. Because the historic moment of who he was and what he represented for the country, but also particularly black people. No, really good point. And I think those crowds, Mansfield, put it in context because this is 94. Let's go back to 92. What had happened in 1992 in Los Angeles? And I don't think you can talk about the 94 murder charges and the 95 trial without understanding where this community was, where the Los Angeles community was, where the country was on the issue of race. So set that stage for us. Well, you're correct, uh, Ariva. Uh, 1992, we had Rodney King and the beating of Rodney King. We all saw that. And then we saw the miscarriage of justice when we saw those five police officers get acquitted. And then, of course, we had the Rodney King riots in Los Angeles. Yes, Los Angeles was a tinderbox at that, during that period of time. And we were very suspicious as to whether the system, the criminal justice system, could give a black man a fair trial. And because they didn't give Rodney King a fair trial in the Simi Valley courthouse. And no, I, just to also, also uh, underscore this point, O.J. Simpson was so big during that period of time that during his slow chase, not only did everybody go to the freeway if they could to get a glimpse of it, but that has never been duplicated since that time. No president, no governor. No celebrity has ever had that outpouring, and that was support. Those people were not saying, you criminal, you murderer. They were saying, don't do it, OJ. Turn yourself in. You're going to be all right. That was the, that was the census of what those folks were doing. You know, I, I, one of the interviews I did this morning was for the UK, and one of their reporters was recounting that story of the slow chase and the people out on the freeway. And kind of dripping in sarcasm, judgment, critical of the people, not having what both of you just provided, that backdrop of how O.J. Simpson was one of the first millionaires, one of the first super successful athletes, a hero in the black community. And as you said, Mansfield, we were trying to encourage him not to take his own life. We That's were right. telling him, we got you. You can get right. through this. You know, turn right. yourself in. Don't kill yourself. And right. I think this reporter in his brain uh, thought folks should have been shouting, you murderer, uh, you know, you horrible person, you monster. And it, it just really shines such a bright light on the racial divide. You know, I asked the question coming into the segment did the trial of O.J. Simpson divide our country along racial lines or did it reveal those already existing deep, deep, deep fissures? Uh, Jamar, I would imagine if you ask five white people and five black people today about O.J., you would get different responses. There, to this day, people are still very entrenched in their beliefs about his guilt or innocence. Yeah, but I think a huge part of the racial divide is how Black people have been perceived in this country and how that carries around events that happen with and for and to Black people in this country. And so usually when the criminal justice system hasn't been fair to Black people, usually white people have jumped on board and carried those same perceptions, right, carried those same messages, and we've seen that. And so I think to your point, right, if you ask five Black people, five white people, you're going to get two different things because in the 1990s, right before they passed the crime bill, it was, yes, these black and brown people are criminals. Oh, yeah, if they're standing before a judge, they must have done it, right? And, and these sort of things that are happening. And so people didn't look, white people wouldn't have looked at OJ as a, a, a football player, right? An athlete, as somebody who transformed the community. They looked at what they saw on TV and didn't look at what was past the television. And well, that's so what we were able to do. 
so interesting how quickly they turned on him. This hero that we just said was able to transcend race and become uh, integrated in many ways into the white community. When those charges were lodged against him, boy, did we see a difference in the way yeah. he was treated and responded to. When we come forward, we're going to get into that historic 1995 double murder trial of O.J. Simpson. Stay with us. KBLA Talk 1580. Right time. More of Ariva Martin in real time when we come forward. forward. I'm Amber Payton. Here's the latest on the Black Information Network. O.J. Simpson has died at the age of 76 after battling prostate cancer. Simpson was famously acquitted of the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman in the 1990s after his main attorney, Johnny Cochran, convinced the jury of his innocence. It makes no sense. It doesn't fit. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Despite his NFL career and later legal issues, he became well-known in entertainment and advertising, notably as Mr. Hurst. Former President Donald Trump says he believes the election interference case in Georgia will be tossed out. He made those remarks this week during an Atlanta fundraising visit in a Chick-fil-A stop in the West End. Leading the way in the case is Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis, who is Black. Trump also stated he's done more for the Black community than anyone since President Lincoln and maybe including Lincoln. That's the latest. I'm Amber Payton on your home for 24-7 News, the Black Information Network. Still very slow in Hollywood at this hour, 101 southbound from Hollywood Boulevard all the way down into the East L.A. interchange. You can expect lots of delays through that stretch. Santa Monica, it's really tight on the 10 freeway headed eastbound, starting from 20th Street in Santa Monica all the way also to the East L.A. interchange. We've got a crash in Hawthorne, 405 southbound, right before Rosecrans. It's on the right shoulder, traffic slow from Santa Monica Boulevard. And uh, in the Costa Mesa area, slow on the 55 northbound from Palo Reno all the way up to Edinger. Come to Dodger Stadium on Monday, April 15th when the Dodgers take on the Washington Nationals and be one of the first 40,000 in attendance to receive a Jackie Robinson Brooklyn Dodgers hat presented by UCLA Health. For tickets, visit Dodgers.com slash promotions. This is the KBLA Sports Minute with Ray Richardson. Ray Richardson. I'm a bad man. For many people, the first thing that comes to mind when they hear the name O.J. Simpson is the infamous car chase in L.A., a year-long double murder trial that aired on TV every day, the emergence of a lawyer named Johnny Cochran, and a not guilty verdict heard around the nation. Those are the storylines that will follow O.J. Simpson to his grave. When Simpson died early Thursday morning from prostate cancer at age 76, he was more known for his alleged involvement in the 1994 murders of his ex-wife Nicole Brown Simpson and her friend Mark Goldman. Before Simpson's life took a tragic turn, he was one of the most gifted running backs to ever carry a football, a Heisman Trophy winner at USC, an 11-year career in the NFL, Hall of Fame inductee, the first NFL running back to rush for 2,000 yards in a season. So sad that O.J. Simpson will always be remembered for something else. No debates, no speculation, just the info you need. That's your KBLA Sports Minute. I'm Ray Richardson on KBLA Talk 1580. KBLA Talk 1580. We've got a lot to talk about. Hi, I'm Tavis Smiley. And I'm Captain Mayor Emma Sharif. You have no doubt been hearing promos and expert conversations on our various weekday shows and downloading details at KBLA1580.com about our climate justice campaign, which is now in full effect. The city of Compton is pleased to partner with KBLA Talk 1580 to celebrate Earth Day 2024 as we serve, share, and help our city shine. And KBLA Talk 1580 is just as excited to join the city of Compton as we broadcast live and bring our KBLA delegation with us to help clean and beautify our community and you are invited to join us. Come meet us on Saturday, April the 20th from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. at 212 West Cypress Street in Compton as we fan out to clean up our city. The first 50 KBLA listeners to hit our website at kbla1580.com will receive a free KBLA tea when you join us on Saturday morning, April 20th from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m at 212 West Cypress Street in Compton. Now, no show, no shirt, but sign up at kbla1580.com right now to help us clean up Compton as part of Earth Day 2024. We will see you on Saturday, April the 20th, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. at 212 West Cypress Street in the city of Compton to do our part for Earth Day 2024. We are KBLA Talk 1580, caring about the climate, caring about the community, cleaning up Compton. 
If you say you care about the community, you have to also care about the climate. We're KBLA Talk 1580, and we've got your black. black. We used to argue about whose turn it was to clean the gutters. But then I had Leaf Filter gutter protection installed. Wait, I told you Leaf Filter had free inspections and estimates and a lifetime guarantee. Meaning we never have to argue about whose turn it is to clean the gutters again. But I visited LeafFilter.com slash beacon first. No, I did. It doesn't matter who. Visit LeafFilter.com slash beacon to schedule your free gutter inspection and get up to 30% off today. See representative for warranty details. Promotion is 20% off plus a 10% senior or military discount. One discount per household. Without the ones like you who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you with professional-grade industrial supplies. Count on real-time product availability and fast delivery. Call, click Granger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. My mom has taken up going to the park to practice yoga. My dad's going to a club, but not a book club, a salsa club. Finding new hobbies comes with age. My mom has started getting lost and not knowing where she's going. Becoming lost or disoriented doesn't. Confusion with time or place may be a sign of Alzheimer's. An early diagnosis can help improve the quality of life for your loved one. Learn the warning signs of Alzheimer's at 10science.org. We are back, and Jamar Brown and Mansfield Collins are joining me in this segment. We're talking about O.J. Simpson. He died at the age of 76, and it has been all over the news today, and a lot of the conversation hasn't been about his great football career at USC, or in the NFL. It's been about that 1995 double murder trial that took place in a courtroom right here in Los Angeles, California. It's a trial that lasted a year, uh, broadcast on major networks daily. The country riveted, glued to the television screen, watching this trial play out of an African-American man accused of killing his ex-wife, a white woman, and her white friend. Many in the L.A. community believe that he was guilty. It was a slam dunk case, and it would be a pretty shut and close case. Uh, O.J. Simpson had what is now known as the dream team, F. Lee Bailey, Robert Shapiro, uh, and, of course, Johnny Cochran leading that team, all of them becoming superstars and household names. The judge even became a household name. There were several witnesses uh, who played uh, pivotal roles in the trial, international media, I mean, media from all over the world uh, camped outside that courtroom, and it became one of the biggest stories of 1995 and beyond. So Mansfield, you are a criminal defense lawyer. I'm sure you, like the rest of us, were glued to your television, uh, probably were friends with Johnny Cochran and maybe had some inside information, but take us to what happened to Nicole Brown Simpson, her friend, Ron Goldman, and how do we get to charges against OJ? Well, um, OJ um, had divorced his wife um, and he was in the process, according to OJ, he was in the process of trying to get back together with his wife and that wasn't working out. And OJ indicated that he was going into his, another direction with a, someone else, and he had a girlfriend. But then all of a sudden, we hear that his wife, his ex-wife, and his ex-wife's boyfriend now uh, have been killed in a violent incident uh, at their apartment complex. And the rumors automatically are spreading that it must have been OJ Simpson that did it because he had a there was some kind of history of uncharged uh, prior domestic violence situations involving OJ and his wife. And that that hit the media like a like a, a tidal wave. In a sense, almost like in the Mark Ridley Thomas case, the media went after OJ. You say we build up our heroes, and then the media's job seems to be to tear them down. So the media immediately started casting the shaping the story that it must have been OJ. Who else could have done it? He had this history. And so the media was going after OJ, just like the media went after Mark Ridley Thomas. The difference is OJ Simpson actually had, after jury selection, a jury of his peers. There were 
nine black jurors out of 12 in OJ's jury pool, jury, jury final jury. Mark Ridley Thomas only had two black jurors in his trial. There's another distinction that I just want to draw before we really get back into OJ. So OJ was tried in the Los Angeles Superior Court. Mark Ridley Thomas was tried in the federal court. Those are decisions that you have to sort of look at and say, well, why didn't Mark Ridley Thomas get charged and tried in Los Angeles Superior Court? Current Price is being charged in the Los Angeles Superior Court. Why wasn't Mark Ridley Thomas there? The only thing I can think of is that the jury pool is so different that it, if in fact OJ Simpson's case had been brought in federal court, he probably would have been found guilty because the jury pool makeup is is aligned against having black jurors on the panel. So the real distinction is OJ was very lucky that he was in the Los Angeles Superior Court for that jury trial. And he was very lucky that he had the best. He had a dream team. He had someone on that team. Johnny Cochran became the greatest lawyer in our generation, uh, unmatched by anybody else. And he opened the door for opened the door for a lot of black lawyers to follow in his footsteps. Very few can, but he still opened the door. Yeah, let's talk. Let's get into you know that trial again, the trial of the century, Jamar. The trial televised uh, mm -hmm. every day. Like I said on major networks, people were missing time from work, getting in trouble at work, trying to watch their television set. We didn't have social media, so we couldn't, uh, you know, watch it on Facebook or watch it on, you know, any social media platform. So people literally had to watch it on television. Uh, why were you as a kid so fascinated? You said you were a kid. Your parents were telling you to stop watching it. Why were you so fascinated <laughs> with this trial? Yeah, but I think that was the thing, right? It was the celebrity of it. It was all the media attention. Everybody was talking about it. And I think part of it is because of who he was, right? He wasn't uh, Joe Schmo, for lack of better words, right? That lived down the street that probably is on trial and not getting the same kind of attention, right? And things would be happening in that case, right? So for me, that's particularly what it was. And at the time I was interested in going to law school. And so <laughs> I was particularly drawn to that. But I think broadly across the board, just kind of what we kind of alluded to was, that was also very formative for me and for a lot of folks in my generation around what race meant in this country, right? Growing up in the 90s and talking about race, um, experiencing it even in a different way than my parents, my grandparents, my great grandparents at the time. And you grow up hearing about racial division, and but you're not quite sure. And I think that was the first time we had it right in our face that we actually could see the division of how Black people have had to fight and survive in this country, but white people have misperceived and misjudged black people and now are using the system, the criminal justice system to actually uh, go against this uh, individual who attained a lot of success, right? Uh, and it was a lot of back and forth that was happening. Um, and so, you know, as Mansfield said, right, there was a, a judge, there's the judge, there's the lawyers, but the lawyers weren't all black, right? There was like Rob Kardashian, I think was one of the lawyers, right? And so it wasn't also just this all black people trying to protect this black man, right? He was smart enough to have lawyers who represented different communities as part of his case. And so those are some of the things that I think drew out um, in, in particular of how we started to look at the, some of the racial divisions and how black people were viewed in the country. And this was also a successful black man um, mm -hmm. and how he was being treated by the system. It's interesting. Alan Dershowitz was one of the attorneys for O.J. Simpson at the time. And we know Alan Dershowitz, a uh, Harvard mm -hmm. professor, has now become sure. pretty much a MAGA lawyer, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. very much Oddly aligned enough. with uh, Fox News, Donald Trump and Trumpism. Uh, Mansfield, you said there was a presumption. Yes, we don't want to minimize domestic violence. And unfortunately, domestic violence, intimate partner violence before OJ Simpson wasn't taken very seriously in this country. If you mm. were beaten up or abused by your partner and you called the police and they showed up and your partner was someone like OJ Simpson, they would give him a slap on the wrist. They wouldn't arrest him. And we know uh, Nicole Brown had called the police on multiple occasions alleging that uh, OJ Simpson had engaged in violence against her. Uh, all that changed after that was revealed. The way prosecutors, the way law enforcement treated domestic violence was very different. But there was this presumption that if he used violence against her before, 
He's got to be angry and jealous about, you know, her friend, Ron Goldman. Uh, and he had to do it. But there was a problem, Mansfield. And the problem was the LAPD. So this is, again, going back to 1992, some of the racism, the pervasive systemic racism in the Los Angeles Police Department was revealed during the civil unrest in 1992 as white officers would protect affluent neighborhoods, affluent homes, and literally refuse to go into uh, some of the black neighborhoods, some of the brown neighborhoods, and, and provide that same level of protection. Bill Gates, the you know the now infamous racist police chief at the time of 1992, so again, that's the backdrop. So here is the prosecuting attorney, Marsha Clark, uh, Christopher Darden, let's just face it, outgunned by this dream team uh, on all fronts, not just their legal acumen, their courtroom swagger, I'll call it, but their media savviness, all of that in favor of the dream team. But a bigger problem for the prosecution is their case was put together by a very incompetent and racist LA Police Department. Talk about the role that the police department played in really uh, sinking the prosecution's case. Well, I can tell you this, when Mark Furman testified and then it was revealed during his testimony, during cross-examination of his testimony, that he had used the N-word, and I'm not gonna say the N-word, on your radio show, but he used the N word 44 times in connection with an interview that he was being interviewed in to be a consultant on a movie that a filmmaker was writing a script for. If I had been on the jury, I just need to be honest with you, Ariva, and, and your audience. If I was on a jury, it would be very difficult for me to accept anything coming from the LAPD police department knowing that they had someone, a chief detective, investigating and collecting evidence and making opinions and making findings that was so racist that he felt that it was okay to use the N-word in a very casual manner all the time. So, uh, yes, there were, um, this case not only dealt with incompetence, but the racial overtones when that hit the, the courtroom Let's just put it this way. The, 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 the country, the world was on fire to hear that for the first time, because that really was the first time that the entire public, the entire community, white, black, yellow, brown, could actually hear that a police officer was so racist and felt so protected that he could use the N-word on a casual basis all the time. And let's not forget he was charged with perjury. He perjured himself on the witness stand. He lied about making those racial slurs, racial epithets. And he was, after the O.J. Simpson trial, Mark Furman was charged with perjury. He pled no contest. He didn't serve jail time. But the star witness, and he was supposed to be LAPD's star detective, uh, was actually charged with perjury. And I don't care what color you are, if a police department has as its star witness someone that perjures themselves the prosecution can basically pack up their bags and go home. When we come forward, we got to talk about the lasting racial implications of that trial and why today many, many white people still believe that O.J. Simpson killed his ex-wife and his and her friend. Stay with us, KBLA Talk 1580. You're listening to Ariva Martin in real time on KBLA Talk 1580. To help combat climate change, LADWP is helping neighborhoods have better access to electric vehicles by awarding nearly $130 million in EV rebates to customers just like you. From big savings on used EVs to building new charging plazas, LADWP is charging ahead to help all Angelenos experience the benefits of EVs. Get rebates of up to $4,000 for a used EV and $1,750 for a charger. Learn more at LADWP.com slash EV. That's LADWP dot com slash ev it's the celebration of a living legend it's the farewell tour it's me featuring frankie bezel thank you for the love The Mother's Day celebration, May 12th in the Kia Forum. In commemoration, coming your all white. Get tickets at Ticketmaster. 
Presented by the Black Promoters Collective. To help combat climate change, LADWP is helping neighborhoods have better access to electric vehicles by awarding nearly $130 million in EV rebates to customers just like you. From big savings on used EVs to building new charging plazas, LADWP is charging ahead to help all Angelinos experience the benefits of EVs. Get rebates of up to $4,000 for a used EV and $1,750 for a charger. Learn more at LADWP.com slash EV. That's LADWP. Dot com slash EV. KBLA Talk 1580. We've got a lot to talk about. KBLA Talk 1580, connecting you with services and solutions. Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles is a nonprofit law firm that protects and advances the rights of the most underserved, leveling the playing field and ensuring that everyone can have access to the justice system. Every year, LAFLA provides free, high-quality legal services to more than 100,000 people living in poverty across greater Los Angeles. Their unique combination of neighborhood offices, self-help centers at courthouses, and domestic violence clinics puts Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles on the front lines in vulnerable communities and at the forefront of change. LAFLA's expert team of attorneys, paralegals, and support staff works to provide direct representation, offer counsel and advice, provide referrals, and educate the community about their legal rights through workshops and seminars. With locations all over LA, you can access their services or volunteer to help no matter where you live. And if you have an urgent issue, call 213-235-0060. That's 213-235-0060. To get legal help, make a donation or volunteer, visit LAFLA.org. LAFLA.org. This is a community call to action from KBLA Talk 1580. We are back, Jamar Brown and Mansfield Collins, and we're talking about O.J. Simpson. That's the biggest story in the news today. So Johnny Cochran does something that's brilliant in that courtroom because cases are not just about the law. Uh, He has OJ stand up and try to put on the black gloves because what the prosecution's case was built on was that whoever killed Nicole and Ron wore these black gloves. There's one at the scene of the crime and one at OJ's home, which many people believe was planted there by one of these racist cops. Uh, and O.J. Simpson, 6'1", 200 plus pounds, uh, stood there struggling. Now, some people said it was all theater, but who knows? He was struggling to get those gloves on. And Johnny Cochran said, and we'll never forget, if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. And for many people, they believe that was a turning point. And my producer reminds me, yes, it's not just white people that believe O.J. committed these murders. Many African-Americans believe it. Many People have theories that O.J.'s older son was somehow involved in helping him commit the murders. So there have been all kinds of conspiracy theories and theories about what happened. No one was ever charged other than O.J. Simpson, uh, not really any other serious uh, suspects. This jury, though, predominantly black, as Mansfield said, acquits O.J. Simpson. Uh, We'll never forget that scene where Johnny Cochran is, is, you know, grasping his client's shoulder and they're all jubilant and happy about the verdict. But this, uh, we didn't see folks take to the street, Jamar, but a lot of people, black and white, but predominantly white people were very, very angry because in this country, a black man cannot get away with killing a white woman. I mean, we, we have to put that in historical context. That is just never, ever the way our criminal justice system is supposed to work. Well, that's number one. And I think number two, part of some of the issue, I think also is too, this system that they were trying his life under wasn't built to protect him. And somehow he made it through this system, right? Through the trial and everything that happened, you know, in the courtroom, right? Because typically what would have happened in a lot of cases, there were a lot of black men, they go before the court, there is some kind of trial, there's tons of evidence thrown into the courtroom, and then they're put in jail. And this is the first time, especially with the defense a uh, team led by a black lawyer where in lack of better words, where they beat the system, right? Where he was acquitted in this particular case. And so I think that that's one of the things, but what we saw coming out of that was a lot of people connected his guilt, not so much to the evidence presented in the trial, but so much to his race and who he was going into the trial. 
And that's the difference when sometimes you have someone who's highly successful or a celebrity, athlete, et cetera, and then they go into trial. Sometimes it gets very caught up in who the person is versus the actual evidence. And obviously, you all have already outlined certain points where evidence was presented. You know, the star witness was tried on perjury and all those things. We don't have to go through that. And so when you get so caught up in the individual and you get away from the evidence, you land in sometimes this place where even when he walked out of the courtroom acquitted, it was still about him uh, and what happened with him uh, in the terms of the trial and in the system where they thought he would be guilty. And Mansfield, it was an odd position for a lot of black folks because Robert is like, right. A lot of black people believe he did it. A lot of black people by now were not big fans of OJ Simpson. Uh, they believe he had turned his back on the black community, that he thought he had somehow transcended race, that because he was married to a, a white woman, because uh, he was accepted in the white advertising world, the commercial world, the entertainment world, that he was no longer black. And he once said, when someone asked him, was he black? He says, no, I'm OJ. So black folks had a lot of mixed feelings about this. Uh, they felt good, uh, as Jamar said, that a black man, quote unquote, beat the system. Uh, but they also felt conflicted because this was no longer their hero. This was not the guy they were rooting for, the guy from the projects in San Francisco that made it big. This was the guy now that made it big and turned his back on the folks that were there for him and were a part of why he made it so big. Yes, you're correct. And if I remember during that period of time, the conversations that I had with members of the black community the minority view, the minority view was that he was guilty. The majority view in the black community at that time was that he was not guilty. The majority view, almost I would say three to one. At the same time, whenever we had a conversation with a white person about OJ, especially after the verdict, it became very tense and it always bordered on whether I should continue this conversation and risk <laughs> losing a friend or an association, or should I just, you know, plow ahead in the interest of principles? And it reminds me of having conversations today about Donald Trump with folks that are so gun ho about Donald Trump. This was almost a precursor for the racial divide in America, almost a precursor to what we're going through right now with Donald Trump and the MAGA group. This was almost a precursor to that. Um, but the excellent other point, man. So excellent point. It, it became like religion and politics, right? When you were in a, a party or at an event and OJ would come up, you had to make a decision. Yeah. Do I sit here and support him and, and listen to, you know, get into a fight with people who are saying he's a murderer, he's a monster? He, you know, listen to that, try to give them a more nuanced yes. approach about the fact that in our criminal justice system, the prosecution must prove beyond reasonable doubt. And when they don't do that, an acquittal is appropriate. It's not for you or I to try to get into whether the person did it or not. That's not how our system works. That's why they're defense lawyers. Your job is to protect that person's constitutional rights, to make sure they get their due process rights. So you did have to make that choice. And I do think Jamar Mansfield is right. This is uh, this is pre-MAGA. This is the country being divided over a black, successful black man who a lot of white folks thought needed to be brought down a notch, right. a really big notch. Mm -hmm. And when he wasn't, mm -hmm. there was outrage. There was white outrage. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and I think that that's the, we still see some of that today, unfortunately, right? We got a black president and Donald Trump decided after that, oh no, I'm against everything he was going, he put in place. I'm going to run. I'm going to divide the country. I'm going to win the election and I'm going to dismantle everything that he set up and put things in place, such as now with Roe, lack of protections for reproductive rights, right? Putting three Supreme Court justices, that's going to last us for a long time to reverse, right? And so we have to think about those kind of things when we think of our elections and when we think of the discourse that we allow, right, around our elections and around policy and how we manage our systems also. And then the other piece that's important around the OJ trial too, this was right before the 1994 crime bill, right? And so when you start thinking about the long conversation over decades that we've had around crime and justice and, and the criminal justice system, those racial divisions still exist. And now the MAGA movement is still using them to this day. 
Yeah, the MAGA movement is bigger and stronger than ever. And, you know, right underneath the conversations we were having, Mansfield, about the legal system was really a bigger conversation about race and place and where people belong and what people should be in what spaces and places. And as much as we were celebrating OJ for breaking these barriers, there were many white people who believed that he had gotten what they would call too uppity that he was uh, you know, in places and spaces, particularly married to a white woman. We don't have time to get into that, but that was again, interracial marriages were not nearly mm -hmm. as prevalent uh, in the 1980s as they are today. And it was frowned upon by many. And a lot of white people did not approve of a black man being married to a white woman. We've got to leave it there. Such an interesting conversation. Thanks to both of you for your insights and enlightening our viewers and our listeners on this really uh, important topic. Next voice that you hear will be Robin Ayers and the Raw Report right here on KBLA Talk 15.